May I please request you to take your seats, please? Can you sit here? Sir, kindly take the photographs later. Please, thank you. Mr. Abhishek Kapoor, CEO Purvankara Limited. Mr. Ashwinder R. Singh, CEO Residential Bharti Urban. Mr. Subhakar Rao Supar, Surapani, Chairman and Chief Coach Champions Group. Mr. Pratik Kataria, Director Sainath Developers. Mr. Vikas Vadhvan, Group CEO, PropTiger.com, Housing.com and Makan.com. May I now request Mr. Kukreja to start the panel discussion, please. Thank you very much. I once again request everyone to quickly please sit, take your seats. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to see a full house here enthused with the real estate scenario of the country. And I'm delighted to be a part of this uh, very, what should be a very engaging uh, and thought-provoking panel discussion regarding the demand drivers on the residential side of real estate. So um, without further ado, I would like to start this discussion. And um, the format we'd like to follow is that we'd like to keep it more conversational and um, of course, I would even invite uh, the panelists here to express their opinions uh, besides the person I'm asking the question to. If you have an opinion, please go ahead and express. And also we will leave ample time to come to all of you with uh, your views or your questions that you might have for any of the panelists. So I would like to begin this session now with this whole aspect that we keep talking about, the real estate market and more particularly the residential real estate market. And when I was invited to be, a panel, uh, to be a moderator for this session, the first thought that came to my mind is that, you know, it is rather ironical that when you read the papers, when you read our finance minister's statement yesterday, which happened to happen at another summit taking place at Hyatt, where she uh, sort of exhorted the private sector to come up, uh, come forward and invest in a fast developing nation or fastest probably developing nation on the planet, uh, you see that things are very positive. And then when you read other pages of the newspaper, you find that real estate market is still in a slump. I, I'm sure many of you would disagree with that, but real estate market still has its challenges. And uh, we find the real estate scenario, especially the private players, the private industry, uh, up in the news for the wrong reasons. I, as an architect and urban planner, uh, only believe in buildings coming up, and I strongly, of course, believe in buildings coexisting with nature. But then when you see that the news is more about buildings coming down rather than being built, you start wondering that what's wrong with our industry. So I think today we have a very diverse panel, and uh, it would be nice to get views from this very diverse aspect of real estate that all of them represent about where the residential sector is poised. Let's try to unravel whether the market is in a slump or really the market is at its peak because numbers seem to always suggest different notions of it. So I'm going to begin here with our young panelist Pratik. And um, we all know that today we are told that the dem uh, we all in India have the advantage of the demographic dividend. And we know today that the buyer's profile is turning more and more younger, as you, as you see over the years. So I would like to ask this uh, uh, from you, Pratik, that today's buyer, when you see the profile typically, is a young audience, a young consumer. What is it that you find different in their outlook or their search when they are looking for a residential property? Hello, yeah. So uh, thank you for the question. Uh, I, I see a different consumer altogether again. 
right? Uh, obviously, we have had experiences from our leaders and going forward, we implement that in understanding the behavior of the consumer. What do they want? Obviously, they are more stress is on amenities nowadays. And obviously, they, uh, they would admire a project which has uh, uh, lower wastages at the same period of time. And obviously, the work-life balance is much more important nowadays for them. Having said that, uh, I, I see uh, different asset classes going ahead uh, and exploring different asset classes like student living and co-living because they need their workplaces also, which is mobile or maybe a hybrid place where they would want to work as well as closer to their residential, spend time with family and day in, day out, I am seeing customers who are getting more nuclear in their way of living. And that is uh, where I see the millennials coming in and having a big part. And also uh, with amazing amount of savings that have come up, uh, we are poised to have a great asset class going ahead, a good consumer base from the uh, younger generation where they'll put in money first in real estate. Uh, these weren't the times when uh, before COVID they wouldn't prefer this asset. And right now, I'm seeing that shift happening, coming on, yeah. So Abhishek, uh, when Pratik talks about the fact that, you know, uh, the younger profile, the younger buyers are looking at lots more amenities, lots more facilities in their projects, uh, the challenge then starts coming that you provide what the buyer is asking for, but then there is always that uh, very sensitive price barrier that people start talking about that you know how much and at what cost and one of the aspects which I'm sure a lot of you would agree in our real estate which plays out is the fact of the land cost because that starts making projects literally start making or breaking projects and becomes a big driver as far as the demand and supply also works so what are your thoughts about the fact what Pratik just mentioned that you know there is this uh, desire to, to have that much more in a project, but then also comes the aspect of uh, price sensitivity. Um, thanks, uh, Dikshu. Uh, I think, let me just take a couple of points on what um, Pratik mentioned. Uh, one is what we are seeing is that the millennials who did not prefer to buy have taken a decision now to buy. That's the biggest fundamental shift that's happened. Uh, looking at our own numbers, um, millennials would have been about seven to eight percent of our total um, volumes that we are doing. That's gone up to 17 percent on increased volume. Just think about it. So the numbers have completely changed as far as, you know, the younger generation is concerned and wanting to buy versus wanting to rent. I mean, earlier on, uh, this is about two years back, pre-COVID, everybody was talking a lot more about co-living, a lot more about, you know, renting and things like that. Why should we buy? But that, that shift has happened tremendously. The second interesting thing that's, uh, that's there with the millennials is they're extremely tech savvy. They want to buy online, including real estate, which is very interesting. So, you know, we're seeing the number of uh, video calls that we do in, in terms of, and the kind of research that they do in the digital media, social media, and then they reach out to you, the kind of questions, it's, it's, it's way different than a, than a normal, you know, consumer. So they are different, very clearly. Um, that's as far as the consumer profile is concerned. Uh, coming to the land piece and the piece of how much uh, for them or for any of any customer, um, uh, nothing is enough. They always want more value, more bang for the buck. I think what's happened really is that uh, as a design, as a thought process, even developers are focusing on creating amenities which add value to people's life. And I think that shift instead of just creating something for the purpose of marketing and anchoring it around and not necessarily something which is practical, uh, has shifted tremendously, especially during the COVID and post-COVID period. Um, because there are clear trends of what is it that they want and what are they looking for and they ask for it. In fact, you get feedback uh, from, from a whole lot of customers saying, you know, uh, why wouldn't you do this? And then, you know, that obviously comes back and you put it back in the design and go back to it. But the point I'm making is that I think uh, there is a change in the way they're expecting. Now, as far as price is concerned, land cost is clearly a challenge. 
Um, it's gone up, you know, Anshuman spoke about it a little while back. Uh, increasing land prices become a challenge. Uh, but the part that is, that is also uh, important for us to understand is that the affordability has gone up. So um, yes, you know, we should watch that very, very carefully. And we should be very wary about high uh, cost of land acquisition because that effectively impacts pricing and then your margins and they're on you know, finance cost, which is the other big cost uh, of, the, of the project. So uh, the point I'm making is that there is enough wallet share. So if you, I'll give you one more data point. Uh, if you look at the wallet share, average wallet share, uh, for a customer, it's at about 45% of their wallet share. Typically, real estate could be anywhere between 50 and 55% of the wallet share generally speaking. And if you see that trend um, over, over years and you compare it with, say, oil prices, commodity prices, and you s plot that graph, you know, some of the reports that have been published, I think that wallet share will go up as we go along. So they will buy larger unit. Uh, they will pay more for the right amenities. They will pay more for branded strong developers. Which is, which is something we are seeing because there is clearly a consolidation of demand that's happened today. Right. So I think overall speaking, um, I mean, uh, you're right, uh, there is a lot of change and land prices we should be very, very wary and careful about. That, that's a good perspective to get. And continuing a little more about this new age buyer, because when we are talking about demand drivers in real estate, I think we really need to acknowledge that there is this whole young profile that is looking at real estate and buying probably their first home. And also comes a very important aspect which I'd like to address to you, Vikas, is the medium of how they go about buying. I mean, of course, we'll probably talk about COVID and its effects a little while later, but the fact that we've all start, start, uh, started to embrace technology so much, and particularly, again, the younger profile that we are talking about, so you represent uh, the, that part of the industry, whether it is uh, prop.com, housing.com, and these whole dot-com phenomena that entered into real estate, and that changed a perspective of how real estate actually moved in this country. So what are your thoughts about, uh, share with us your experience about this whole shift in the industry. Absolutely, Dikshu, and uh, thanks, uh, first of all, uh, for, for inviting us on this panel. Uh, uh, in terms of the trend which we are noticing, uh, there is definitely a clear trend in, uh, in the younger population coming and searching online and in fact becoming a buyer of real estate. So if I share a data point, 10 years back, the average age of a searcher was touching around 40, 40 plus. And if we look at today, the average age of a searcher is in early 30s. So that clearly shows that younger and younger population is searching for homes. There are a couple of data points which also uh, shows the, uh, the post-COVID era impact uh, where the younger population is searching for homes beyond bigger cities because there is a flexibility which is provided by their employers that they don't need to come to office five days a week. There is a work from home phenomena. Uh, they can stay at a slightly away from, from the uh, bigger cities and still continue to work. So they are searching for homes uh, in, in suburbs or beyond the bigger cities. Uh, the other uh, important aspect which we noticed on the platform in terms of search behavior of, of younger population, uh, as they spent a lot of time in the last two, three years in their back home, because in India, in all the big cities, we have a lot of migratory population, uh, during COVID, they got a chance to go back to their uh, native place and spent a lot of time. They started looking for the better homes and bigger homes in those areas as well. So that also increased demand in tier two and tier three towns. That is also one phenomena we noticed. Uh, I think I, I agree with uh, what Abhishek mentioned. The younger population, their criteria are very uh, very, very clear. One, they are definitely looking at bigger homes because I think work from home phenomena is not going to go away, whether it stays completely work from home or some kind of a hybrid, but you still need a designated workplace in your home. So they are looking for bigger homes. Uh, second, uh, the younger population, they are very brand conscious and uh, 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 whatever they do, whether they buy clothes, whether they buy car or they buy home, they, they prefer specific brands. 
and hence brand plays a lot of role when they do their, their research. And the third piece is they are fine in paying a higher price, but they definitely look for the better amenities. Uh, a lot of influence of uh, tech related uh, uh, features in the homes, whether it is high tech security systems, uh, high end club, swimming pools and so on and so forth, they are fine uh, shelving some extra money to, to get those amenities. So all in all, what I hear coming from you is the fact that you know people are willing to spend or pay that extra buck if they get quality, yes. they get brands uh, or get a high branded product. So uh, what one of the challenges I think Indian real estate has faced is that uh, harshly put, I would say that brands have sometimes let down the consumer and therefore there is so much uh, uncertainty or a feeling of, uh, yeah, the lack of confidence basically that even if you invest in a brand, whether you're going to get what uh, you're paying for. In this perspective, uh, I'd like to have uh, Sudha, uh, Subhakar, your thoughts, since you are representing an international brand and uh, as you were explaining me, you're coming up with an idea in India about a certain kind of real estate of uh, creating this sort of make-believe uh, uh, lagoon developments, even if they are in the heart of India, central India or north India. So it's all this artificial thematic development, which you think ha has a potential and a demand in India. So tell us a little bit about your thoughts about why you feel confident of bringing in a product or bringing in this kind of real estate, uh, which is, which is in many ways in, uh, foreign, uh, when we are talking about creating lagoons in the middle of our country, uh, you know, it is, it is something which doesn't naturally belong there, but what makes you so confident about it? Today, we actually are about to announce almost a hundred of these across every city and every town in India. We're so confident of bringing beach lagoons to every city in India. Because we see th this is the number one amenity that folks desire now, right? Uh, Post-pandemic, everyone wants to be even vacationing very close to home. They don't want to go too far out to vacation. They want these top amenities available right out there. Uh, they walk out of their home, uh, walk, walk into a beach, swim, whatever. Uh, so top amenities like this are going to take over because if you remember Abhishek said, people are looking for real value to be added, not just in another amenity. Here, it's a daily use case amenity. It's a healthy amenity. Yoga on water, uh, uh, eventually kayaking. You can introduce a lot of these, even starting as small as two and a half acre to five acre lagoons. You don't need to do too big of a lagoon. So uh, with, uh, life moving a little more towards suburbs. Uh, Vikas talked about how a uh, lot more of satellite cities are coming, suburbs are taking over. I think you're going to see uh, people wanting to be working from home, vacationing at home, having some of these top amenities right outside their house that they can walk to. Uh, they, uh, from their apartment, they can see a beach. Uh, they can see these uh, luxury, not just see, but also experience these luxury elements, which are going to make them healthier, which is going to make them happier. Uh, look at water, right? Uh, human body is comprised of 75% water. Naturally, that means if you align with water, you're very happy. You might have experienced it. If you go on a beach, if you are on a yacht cruise, you're naturally very happier. For a matter of fact, uh, I have a couple of yachts in Dubai and Goa. I had uh, mega deals done without even uh, spending much by just entertaining a guest on a yacht. So uh, that, that brings me very close to now you're able to entertain people, bring, uh, bring this beach very close to your home. And that automatically means you are a much more happier family. So, so Shubhakar, I don't know with that kind of a uh, pitch or thoughts, how many of the audience are going to shift the investment from Goa to, to what you are trying to create uh, around the country. But you know, I'm now going to shift gears completely from what we are talking about a profile which is a younger profile to another demand driver of residential uh, real estate. And that, I believe, 
in times to come is go going to only uh, multiply, exponentially uh, actually increase, which is our senior citizen housing and old age homes. Uh, because we as a population woefully lack that kind of infrastructure and the kind of changes we are seeing in society, more nuclear families, etc., etc. I'm, I'm sure all of you know those changes that are taking place. I think the natural corollary to that is that there would be more investment and more demand for uh, old age homes or senior citizen housing. So Ashwinder, I'd like your thoughts on it. I know you have a development in Bangalore, which is kind of a self-sustained development, but at the moment, share your thoughts on how you see this kind of a uh, demand driver in, in the form of um, old age homes. Uh, thank you, uh, Dikshu. Yeah. Hello. Yeah, thank you, uh, Dikshu, for this uh, important question. I will kind of club it, uh, why just with senior living, but also with co-living, etc. Right. Uh, see, one of the challenges that the residential sector in India faces unlike uh, the developed uh, countries in Europe and US is that most of the institutional money that comes in India is in the B2B segment, which is not residential. So when we talk about all the financing investment that is happening is either in the office space, kind of leading to industrial and warehousing now. Uh, now these asset classes are very important. Uh, we have some of the senior living projects that are there, which uh, fortunately or unfortunately have not done the way they were in terms of receivables, have not done really that well. Is there a need? There is definitely a need. There is a latent need. Uh, our, our social thought process is changing. Uh, it is no more a taboo if, if somebody is staying in a, a senior living. but. Uh, what I feel is this is going to require a lot of institutional funding to come in and a lot of lazy capital to come in because currently with the way we are, we've just seen demand in the residential sector spurting up in the last two years, which we say is going to be sustainable, but we need to also understand that the demand in the residential sector from 2012 to 2020 was very sluggish. So there was a lot of pent up demand which was there and then the pandemic happened and there was suddenly uh, this uh, calling that everybody realized that having your own home is very important and it is not just an investment, it is also an emotional decision that you take. Uh, my two bits on this is that this is going to be a very important space to look at. This will need a lot of support this will need a lot of support in terms of government policies and uh, some institutional money coming in and we becoming a little more developed on the residential side and a little more organized on the residential side so that it starts with more service apartments being built up uh, where you know you get institutional money and then the confidence comes in and then uh, senior living will happen, but at the scale at which we are talking about, which is there in the US and Europe, I think we are five years uh, maybe uh, into it, and we should see this kind of picking up. But I feel the overall uh, landscape of residential is going to change dramatically for good. Uh, we have seen the way the end user has started buying uh, residential real estate. One of the biggest strengths and the pillar of residential real estate in India, considering its population, its young population, and increasing salaries, great employment opportunities, is the first time buyer, which is always going to be the backbone of this country. Uh, and the other uh, second pillar which we are going to see uh, which is already coming up and I see it when I look at my consumer profile, is the profile that wants to upgrade into a larger home with an extra space. Uh, so, you know, this is going to be a sustained demand and over a period of time there is going to be a good diversification within the residential portfolio and we will see co-living as well as uh, senior living coming up in, in a much uh, developed in an organized manner across the country. So you have sort of done your bit of crystal gazing and given your thoughts. Actually at this point it would be interesting to hear from the other panelists 
If you were to sort of uh, peek into the future, what would, uh, Pratik, your uh, thoughts be on which way this real demand is going to shape up, let's say, in the next 5, 10, 15 years in the real estate segment, particularly residential real estate segment? I have interestingly heard from my seniors, uh, real estate is about location, location, location. And to add to that, it is now about customers, customers, and customers. I see the, uh, I, the, I foresee a vision where uh, if investments into residential real estate come in from fractional ownership, by means of fractional ownership and REIT, the escalation would be further more, right? The demand has to be satisfied with, uh, I agree to what sir told, Ashwinder ji told, uh, senior living, we are really uh, way off right now. It's an emotional decision uh, considering the demographics of India. It's always been emotional decision to uh, have an asset in senior living. Uh, having said that, other options like student living, um, co-housing. So uh, from our next gen members, we got to know that uh, a member was building a residential pr uh, project and interestingly shifted his base and built a, a student living project. Interestingly, he claims that uh, it is giving a yield of 7% right now, which is surprising. I'm looking into it as we speak. But then uh, these indicators are such that we are moving into that area where people are now accepting different modes of real, real estate as well. Pockets like in, in education centers like maybe a Pune or a Bangalore um, where IIMs are there and IITs are there, people are exploring these segments as well and this gives uh, the developers immense courage to experiment into uh, such assets and obviously serve to what the customers want and need. That's right. Abhishek, what would your thoughts be on this? Where do you see the future uh, or which segments of the residential real estate do you see coming up in the next few years? Um, some of the interesting uh, trends that we have seen is that uh, people are now wanting not just apartments, but they also want individual homes. Uh, you know, there were days when we used to say that individual homes were um, second homes. I think that concept kind of has, has evolved. The, uh, we are in plotted development, we are in villa development. Uh, we do a whole lot of that stuff and you know if you just see the, the quantum of uh, yeah. square footage that's got sold out in plotted development more recently um, is simply because people want to have independent homes in communities. Uh, so we see that as a clear trend and it may not just be a second home, it may be a home that we must have. The second piece that we are clearly seeing is a trend towards larger homes, somebody brought that up we are seeing lesser traction on smaller homes, more traction on larger homes. So that is definitely going to be a continuous trend because I think work from home partially or fully has been the trend. So that we believe will continue for quite some time. Uh, for senior living, you know, our, our view is that there is, a, there is a shift in thinking of senior living. There are going to be a lot of people who are not uh, so currently the, 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 the issue is that there is a taboo around it, a cultural taboo around it. Uh, now with the aging population which is going to self-buy for their own use, you don't have to wait for your children to buy. You will buy because you want to be comfortable and you know, nuclearization is a given. Nobody is living together anymore, right? So I think that is something that we believe and I kind of agree with what Ashwinder said in terms of timelines. Over the next four to five years, we definitely believe um, senior living is, and assisted living is going to be a big one. And they go, people are going to voluntarily buy. And it will be everywhere. Um, it will, and people want to buy in city centers, depending on your affordability, people buy in distant places, as long as they're, they're getting that uh, support in terms of uh, being in an assistant. So that we clearly see as a trend. I think the co-living and uh, the rental piece, I think post-COVID there is a bit of a, though rents have gone up everywhere, and that I guess is because people have come back and things like that. But, um, you know, we are still wondering where do we see that one going. So we'll have to wait and watch and see how that pans out. But you've brought in two interesting points. One is that, you know, this sort of uh, uh, desire that everybody has for a larger home. But like you are saying, it's not just apartments, but 
people are looking at villa developments as well. And the second aspect is that people are looking at, you know, bringing in more and more amenities and even maybe moving in the city centers. So to this, Ashwinder, there has always been this debate of um, living in the city center versus living in the suburbs. And of course, one of the fundamental drivers happens to be uh, the land cost. But besides that also come other aspects as in proximity to work and uh, the kind of amenities uh, that you are able to get in, let's say, in a larger development outside the city versus a city center. And many cities, including Delhi, uh, where, for example, I am designing India's first transit-oriented development project coming right here in Delhi, where the FARs are close to almost five and you're looking at very, very high-rise buildings starting to come, and we can already see that in the skyline of a city like Delhi, that you know this redevelopment where you're getting more and more densification happening, and it's happening in other parts of the country as well. So my really uh, question to you would be that how do you see this panning out? Do you see that city centers are the place that people are, the demand drive is more towards city centers? or is it really towards the suburbs? This, uh, to my mind, uh, Dikshu, is, is the most important uh, subject right now because, uh, first of all, I'm quite, um, um, it's very interesting to know the transition development that you're doing and I would definitely love to spend some time on that because that is interesting. And congratulations that you're doing that uh, in Delhi. Uh, See, the city center is obnoxiously expensive in India. And uh, that is why we keep on saying that the rental yields in India are not great. The fact is the rental yields are very good, but the capital value is overpriced in the city center. So when you look at the rental yield of a 5 crore uh, or a 10 crore uh, uh, standalone house and defense colony, and uh, then you look at the rent, obviously you will never get more than one and a half, two percent, or maybe, you know, one percent when you look at the city center. However, as Abhishek pointed out, in Bangalore, uh, so Bharatiya city, which is a 150 acre development, around 18 to 20 million made and under construction, currently the rental yield is at around five percent, which is as good as six to seven percent that Dubai kind of boasts of. And to, to your point, Dikshu, the, the way forward is going to be an integrated township within Bangalore. We have two, three new integrated townships which have been launched and sold like hot cakes. Uh, in our integrated township, we have uh, three million square feet of office. We have the largest office of Infosys. We have IBM, we have Mazurk, we have 7-Eleven. All those people who are working there are staying and we have a school, we have a hotel, we have a mall, all functional. So what it depends is that the capital cost of land, which is an important area, but when Bharatiya city was conceived 12 years back, there was nothing in that area, but today it has become the center of, uh, you know, North Bangalore, which is the boiling pot of Bangalore because the entire new employment generation that is happening, the, all the tech parks which are there, like a Manita tech park, etc., etc., are there. So just to, I have a strong feeling that the way forward is going to be an integrated township. Like in the US, everybody stays in a suburb because they can't afford to stay in a city center in New York or a San Francisco. That is why they go to a Dublin or they go to a Pleasanton, etc., etc. That is how India is going to uh, kind of develop. As I say, we are a developing nation and we need developers to make it developed. And uh, Absolutely. this is kind of my favorite uh, <laughs> line, uh, that you can't develop without a developer and our time has come. We are going to have a lot of integrated townships coming up. The challenge is going to be, of course, land. And how do you procure that land? Do you buy that land? Do you get into a JDA? etc., etc., because, because this is a very complex subject. And I think other aspects to it are also the infra, you know, Bangalore was in the news recently for the wrong reasons, yeah. but about the infrastructure matching with these kind of developments and also the aspect of connectivity. I think that becomes important because you can keep spreading the city horizontally, but how do you really connect it with the city so center? So if you see an example important. of Hyderabad, Hyderabad 
can expand to any extent. But because the infrastructure yes. is great, one, the price doesn't go up. Because the price of real estate and infrastructure are inversely correlated. The poorer the infrastructure, higher the price of real estate. The better the infrastructure, lower the price of real estate. That is why the capital value in Hyderabad, it went up because there was a pent up demand because nothing was happening <coughs> till Telangana was made. However, the mo even if you extend your decision to buy in a particular place by another five kilometers, it is only five minutes. Wow. So and because it is only five yeah. minutes, yeah. you start measuring distance in time and not in terms of the distance. Right. And that is why uh, you are seeing the way uh, Hyderabad has expanded and you will see with this whatever happened in Bangalore. I think it was also in a very particular area this and part it of kind of here. got blown apart in terms of the entire Bangalore has submerged. I was getting call from Africa also, are you fine? I said, yeah, you please take care of your infrastructure before you call <laughs> us. And you, you know, everything was okay. It was one place which kind of got flooded and in the entire world thought that Bangalore has submerged. And you know how our media is, they're very good at it. So, <laughs> <laughs> uh, Abhishek, you wanted to add a point to yeah, this one. Um, mm -hmm. You know, two things. Um, I think if you look at Indian cities, um, whether it is Bangalore or Bombay or NCR, um, you know, all the large cities are growing into separate suburbs. These are city within cities. Now, there will be a connectivity point which is between one city and the other within the framework. For example, um, if you look at Bombay, Thane is a city in itself, right? It's part of MMR, but it's a city. So is Washi, so is Wasai Vira region. In Bangalore, we have a white field, which is a city in itself. So, so you will have city within cities. That is one piece of it. And what happens is that, uh, you know, buying real estate, we do developments which are really, really high end in city center. And of course, we do um, uh, all kinds of large projects which are away from the city center. The point is that geography is very, very sticky. People build their whole ecosystem, social environment in a certain geography. And therefore, that geography remains important. And then the location point of view, which has not changed in this country and will <laughs> not change ever in any part of the world as far as real estate is concerned. Because location is going to be key. Uh, so coming back to the point I was making, the point I was making is that the prices, and you spoke about prices somewhere in the, in the beginning of the conversation between city center and the suburbs. If you see across the world, gradually prices start balancing out. So while initially when a new city is born, the price gap is huge. Over time, as the social infrastructure gets developed in that particular region, the price starts increasing. And it increases much higher than the city center prices. So you see more appreciation in a new city because infrastructure is falling in place. And there will be a point in time in that new city you will have a central area. So this is how it is evolving. And in this country we're not giving birth to new cities and it's the same city which is giving birth to, you know, sub-cities in that region. Right, right. So I uh, sometimes wonder, and I don't know how many of you, this is a question in fact to all of you, uh, as a common man whether you wonder sometimes that our country seems to have the land. We don't have a challenge like many island nations or let's say European nations or many places where there's a huge paucity of land. We seem to have the land. We seem to have the demographic dividends as we call it or really the population which is looking to have a roof over their head. And we also seem to have the finance or the money is there because uh, we are a growing economy. So when all these three things are there, the land, the money, and also the demand, then why does our real estate market fluctuate so much? I don't know how many of you share that same kind of sentiment or have wondered about it, uh, uh, because it's, it's really baffling. It doesn't really fluctuate like that anywhere else in the world as it does here. But I'll leave that question with you. But I'm going to open this to the floor now. If anyone has any question, and I think you have it right there, for any of the panelists, please go ahead. Could we have a mic here? Could we have a mic here, please? So we are going to just take a couple of questions and then wrap up this session. Yeah, I'm Ravinder Agarwal from ECRI Association of Certified Relatives of India. Uh, there are two topics which we have not touched, you know, as far as the residential scenario goes. 
One is the slow progress of land implementation of land pooling policy. I mean, there is so much land available and policies are made, but they are not being implemented. So if we implement these policy, land pooling, pooling policy, then of course True. we can have a lot more land available for development. And second part is RERA, where the execution is not taking place. The decisions are coming, but, but there's no implementation of ex execution of those orders. So all the investors are keeping away. So that is another part. So I completely agree with you on both those. Anybody would like to respond to that? Uh, sir, on RERA, uh, before uh, I come to the uh, land pooling aspect, um, anybody else can take that. See, we have to appreciate one aspect that India has given the best regulators to the world. You look at SEBI, 20 years old. You look at IRDA, insurance, SEBI capital markets, try the telecom regulator. A regulator needs time to season. It is not an easy task. Secondly, all the regulators in the world are centralized. SEBI is centralized in Mumbai. Tri is centralized somewhere else. IRDA is centralized in Mumbai. RERA is, not. RERA is decentralized. There is a shortage of manpower because it is decentralized. Real estate is a state subject. Every state has a different political party. Because every state has a different political party and a different agenda, the support they get, the, uh, the RERA, the support they get from that particular aspect becomes very incongruent. It is not similar. So we have to appreciate that it is one of the most diversified regulators in the world. But mark my words, give them another three, four years. Maybe we can become centralized. Maybe there needs to be more manpower. Hardly any people right now because in, in every state is a country in India. It is bigger than a European country. So these are some of the challenges that are being faced. We are chewing gum as we are walking right now. We should give time to RERA. Three, four years, let it complete 10 years, it is going to be again amongst one of the better regulators in the world. Even a tiny country like UAE has a regulator for the last 15 years, which has a total population, I don't know, million, two million? Yeah, yeah. Which is uh, as big as defense colony? <laughs> so, we have to understand that regulation will take time, but we will come out as the best. Yeah, that's a promise. It is not no, keeping the investors to, away because... So, I, it, I think we should... Uh, yeah. The, these are debates which are very engaging actually, but in the paucity of time, we'll have to move ahead. But you have Vikshu, a question. Just to add you? one point on RERA. Yes, Vikas. Just, just to add yes. one point on RERA, uh, I, I can assure you, while uh, I won't comment on investors, but at least on the consumer side, it has already made a huge impact on the industry. The consumer confidence which we are seeing back in the market, RERA has a role to play. Consumer, when they look at the new properties, they definitely look for a RERA registered project. So one purpose is definitely achieved to a large extent as far as RERA is concerned. Yes, there are flaws, I agree with Ashwinder. I think it takes time for any regulator to settle in and considering this is a decentralized one, it will gonna take slightly more. Uh, Abhishek, would you like to respond to the question about why yeah. land pooling hasn't really taken off? Okay, I'll come to the land pooling, but I think in the, on the previous point, I'll just make one little point, is that we're confusing what's happening with market with RERA. RERA is taking decisions, and the point is, implementation is not happening because the market has gone through evolution where a whole lot of developers, and you know, I was mentioning a little while earlier to somebody, we were 51,000 developers at one point in time. Today, if you count them down, you're almost talking about somewhere in the range of 1,100 to 1,500 developers. Where do you think the okay. rest of the guys about went? land pooling now because we so, are out of time now. So second point yeah. is on the land pooling and I'll quickly, so land per se is a matter which really needs a lot of change. It's not just land pooling as one issue, but there is, and one of the questions you asked is, we have the land, then why not? We have the capital, why not? I think one of the biggest challenges today that any developers face is one is the valuation of the land and that happens because you don't have clear sanitized enough land available in the market and if you have legal issues compliance issues regulatory sure. issues and the time taken to launch from sure. the date you acquire sure you I, we'll problem. take that last question please we are out of time now yes my question is 
Is there a forum that the industry has formed to make sure that you interact with the authorities which tell you what parameters are necessary to be constructed on a piece of land. Um, it reminds me, actually, of a friend of ours who had just come back to India after being a renowned engineer. And he set up the first high-rise building in Bombay. May I please request you for the specific the question, question is, because question is, I've been indicated time is out and they'll pull my chair now. Yeah. <laughs> Let's have the specific really question. That at that stage, high-rise buildings, according to the specifications, mandated in Bombay at least 10 feet of snow based on which you needed to do the construction. In other words, the, there wasn't enough uh, method in the madness of the authorities to understand what really was needed. As an example, all of you today have been saying what would be good so is I'd to have an you integrated... Just for the question, yeah. please. So the real question is, is there a forum that you've started? Sorry, could you repeat that? Is there a forum? Yeah. So uh, uh, there is. Uh, he's saying, is there a forum which kind of engages with the authorities okay. on what is required? There are two very big forums which are very active now, uh, representing the developers. Which is one is Kridai, other is Naritko. There is a very large forum of channel partners called uh, NAR, which is National Association of Realtors. So there are forums, and there's a lot of work that is already going on in this. Thank you. To make it very well, I am precise. sure there would be so much more to discuss on this very, very engaging subject. And like you said, there are many sub aspects we haven't yet touched upon, Let's including… Talk about architects who can contribute more, you have a forum for that. That's what urban planning is. <laughs> Well, even if I was to get started on that one, you won't even be served lunch because I can continue about the state, uh, the poor state, I would say, of urban development and how this country really needs to rise and so many challenges to be met and overcome. But I'm not going to go that route right now. I wish to thank my panelists here who've really brought a, la a real diversity to this subject, which otherwise could sound quite banal about, you know, just a demand driven residential real estate. But you've been able to, I'm sure, get a very varied perspective on the matter. And thank you to the audience for being uh, so cooperative and being great listeners. So with that, thank you very much. Thank you. Mr. Thiru Mal Govindraj, Senior Managing, Managing Director and Executive Board, RMZ Corp. Mr. Ravi Ahuja, COO Commercial Brigade Group. Mr. Uh, Ms. Khair Ulnisa Sheikh, WTCA Board Member, Joint President, World Trade Center. Ms. Anchal Saraf Agarwal, Director, ASF Group. Mr. Ajay Podar, M. 